the day. So unfortunately, uh, Administrator Bridenstein will not be able to join us at lunch today due to a, a, a scheduling conflict he could not get out of. But that's the bad news. The good news is uh, we have a great replacement in uh, Congresswoman Kendra Horn, uh, who is the chairwoman of the Space and Aeronautics Subcommittee, uh, and uh, has had some legislation this week, so I'm sure she'll be talking about that uh, later at, at lunch. So with that, I would like to introduce uh, Julia Hunter from Virgin, and Julia, to introduce our, our first speaker to get the day started right. Thanks so much, Julia. Good morning, everybody. So as Eric said, I'm Julia Hunter, uh, Senior Vice President of Operations for Virgin Galactic, and it is my absolute pleasure this morning uh, to introduce Steve Dixon, uh, the, the new administrator of the FAA. Um, I think most of you in this room know uh, Virgin Galactic is um, a space flight system that is a hybrid or air launch system, which basically means that part of our um, aviation system, while predominantly uh, a space vehicle, is also a hybrid vehicle that carries uh, with a mothership that carries a spaceship underneath it. And one of the things that that means for us is that we work across the board with the FAA through the AVS all the way to the, uh, to the AST side of the house. And uh, we have had a fabulous relationship with the FAA over the time that we've been working um, our licensing program and our flight, uh, flight scenarios. Um, and we, we really look forward to enjoying a great relationship with the, with across the full spectrum of the, of the FAA. So as I said, it's my pleasure to introduce Steve Dixon. Uh, Steve Dixon was sworn in as the FAA Administrator by the U.S. Department of Transportation Secretary, Elaine Chow, on August 12th. Dixon recently retired from service as the Senior Vice President of Flight Operations at Delta Airlines. In this role, he was responsible for the safety and operational performance of the Delta's global flight operations, as well as pilot training, crew resources, crew, crew scheduling, and regulatory compliance. He also flew line operations as an A320 captain and previously flew the B727, B737, B757, and B767. Captain Dixon is a strong advocate for the commercial aviation uh, safety and improvements in our national airspace system, having served as chairman on several industry stakeholder groups and federal advisory committees. A former U.S. Air Force officer and F-15 fighter pilot, Dixon is a distinguished graduate of the class of 1979 of the U.S. Air Force Academy, as well as a graduate of Georgia State University College of Law, magnum cum laude. So again, uh, I think, you know, certainly from my perspective, uh, I don't know Steve Dixon well, as you can probably tell from my introduction, apologies, Steve, uh, but it is uh, anyone who is willing to take on this day of the interweaving of both space and aviation gets a very, very warm welcome. So welcome, Steve Dixon. Well, thanks, Julia, for that very kind introduction. And I uh, also want to thank and give a shout out to uh, Eric and the uh, uh, Commercial uh, Space Flight Federation. Uh, I was talking to Wayne before the uh, morning started, and we really appreciate the significant contributions uh, of the Federation. You're bringing a very high level of ex expertise, experience, and collaboration to the table uh, for us. And uh, when the history of co the commercial space industry is written, uh, we really hope that it recognizes how uh, your organization helped uh, set our path for success. You know, before uh, coming up here, actually out in the in the atrium, we were having a little conversation, and on Monday, I was standing in front of the uh, uh, Hel Helicopter Association International. <clears throat> and, of course, my background is in uh, military fighter jets and as a fighter pilot, and then also as a commercial airline pilot and involved, uh, as you heard, in uh, commercial airline operations for more than 27 years, over a 40-year period. And when I got to the FAA and found out everything that we do with, uh, with space and, uh, and drones and, uh, and now, now helicopters, uh, I'm learning a lot. And uh, I think that those of us uh, in our industry, uh, if you're not learning, uh, if, if you're standing still, 
you know, you're not moving forward. And so I certainly look forward to learning uh, from all of you. And, and in some ways, in the last two days, I've come from one end of our industry to the other, from helicopters up to uh, space travel. So I can't imagine anything more exciting than that. You know, Netflix has a documentary out uh, right now about Scott Kelly, and it's, uh, it's called A Year in Space. And uh, as we know, NASA wanted some data on how the human body stands up to long-term space travel. And, uh, and they got it from, uh, from their study of Scott. So the idea of a trip to Mars isn't as far-fetched as it used to be. But in the documentary, one point really stuck with me. Of all the multiple systems involved in space travel, the most fragile and destructible system is actually the human body. And, you know, we know space is an unforgiving environment. Um, I've done myself about 13 hours in a row in a fighter cockpit. And after a while, that gets pretty tight. In fact, it gets tight after a couple hours. Um, and, of course, space is a whole other level. But while the human body is indeed fragile, uh, the human spirit is stronger than steel. And the American spirit has been on display up in space for six decades. The people who made space history have shown that we can defy our physical limitations, defy the odds, and do what was once thought impossible. Now, having said that, uh, with, with what we see happening today, we really can't use the word impossible anymore, can we? And you can all take some credit for that. America has found a home in commercial space. And the view from there, as you know, seems to be pretty darn good. And as we say in aviation, it's uh, really cavu, ceiling and visibility unlimited. We all grew up watching the, those rockets poke a hole in the atmosphere. Um, and although I myself am still kind of partial to flying an F-15, and I'm hoping at the Singapore Air Show a week after next to see an F-22 or an F-35, after all these years, there are a few things more inspiring in life to see a rocket lift off, especially from American soil. Or see an astronaut make a spacewalk or float around uh, in micro or zero gravity. Uh, but today, a new generation of pioneers like Beth Moses are making it happen. They're ready to capitalize on the space economy. By some estimates, that space economy could be worth a trillion dollars by 2040. And as we know in our business, 2040 is going to roll up on us a whole lot faster than we might think right now. You know the big ticket items, uh, and there's been a lot of discussion uh, in the last uh, day about, the, about these uh, opportunities. Space travel and tourism, satellite servicing, space debris removal, in-space manufacturing, and many satellites to provide high-speed Internet around the globe. Hopefully one day we'll be looking at point-to-point -point suborbital travel. And maybe someday one of your companies can make the Kessel Run like Han Solo did in less than 12 parsecs. Um, now, that's a little bit of, a, of an awkward reference, right? We, we'll have to figure out if, that, if a parsec is a measure of time or distance. I know that's been the subject of some controversy among Star Wars buffs over the years. It wasn't really clear to me, but I digress. Uh, but one thing's crystal clear. These pursuits will have a lasting impact on America the world and our leadership around the world. And as long as every business plan has safety as an essential component, this industry can grow beyond what your projections forecast. But only if we're safe. We know what the public's expectations are in the commercial arena. If it's not safe, take it from a pilot. You're better off staying on the launch pad. The FAA's top priority is the safety of people and property on the ground, as you know. And if it's not your pr top priority, it needs to be. Otherwise, you'll miss out on the next big thing. In fiscal year 2019, uh, we licensed 32 space operations. This year, Wayne tells me that number could easily reach into the 40s. And we're on our way to just about one operation a week in the very near future. We at the FAA are leaning in. We're leaning in in a big way. We don't want to just keep up pace with you. Um, we're putting as many resources and processes in place uh, that we can uh, to be an enabler of your safe operations. That's why we're committed and we will continue to be committed to a process of stakeholder engagement. This past year, we received final reports from three aviation rulemaking committees, including the airspace access and integration 
and spaceport categorization committees. These two committees, supported by many of you in this room, provided numerous suggestions on how we integrate space vehicles into the national airspace system and how, and how we develop the spaceport infrastructure that America needs to support our preeminence in space. Now, the fact that we had aviation rulemaking committees focused on space speaks volumes on how far commercial space transportation has come. And if you want to carve out a spot in the national airspace system, you have to have a regulatory framework to make all that work. In fact, I think we need to start calling it the national aerospace system. What do you think about that? Uh, we're evaluating the committee recommendations now. And while this process plays out, the FAA continues evolving toward more flexible and efficient ways of doing business. Last year, as you know, we issued a notice of proposed rulemaking to safely streamline launch licensing requirements. We received hundreds of comments that are under review currently, and we expect to issue a final rule by the fall of this year. <clears throat> the proposed rule will let operators use a single license for multiple launches for multiple launch sites and will replace cumbersome prescriptive requirements with flexible performance-based criteria. These steps will reduce the burden on operators and help to foster more innovation without sacrificing safety. More fundamentally, the FAA is reorganizing our Office of Commercial Space Transportation. For starters, we have strong, knowledgeable, capable, and innovative leadership in place. Wayne and his team are doing a fantastic job. They're looking for ways to say yes to the continued development and success of this exciting industry. We're placing all licensing activities under one directorate. And as you know, we've also hired a new Executive Director of Operations, Lirio Liu. Now, Lirio comes from our Aviation Safety Rulemaking Office. There's no shortage of energy and passion about our business. Uh, from her, her reputation for action precedes her. So commercial space better get strapped in. May the force be with you. <laughs> and now we have an office dedicated to spaceport policy. We currently have 11 licensed spaceports with a half dozen potential sites in the pre-application phase. This office is helping us determine what services, rules, and regulations will be needed to support spaceports. It will help us determine funding streams, including grants, to develop and sustain the infrastructure. We look forward to collaborating with state and local governments on spaceport investment and integrating spaceports into our nation's critical intermodal transportation networks. Now, spaceports are one visible aspect of our infrastructure, but there are important parts of our infrastructure that are not visible to the naked eye in many cases. They're not physical in nature or visible to our citizens. The adaptations of systems and processes that will enable changes to the, of the way that we manage airspace are critically important. In fact, I saw some of this work my first week on the job at the FAA out at our command center. We're making our airspace more flexible and dynamic. We have to. You see, in the past, space launches were few in number. We could accommodate them by blocking off large swaths of airspace. Uh, but this affects the routing of aircraft in a big way, particularly disruptive along the east coast of the United States. It's like when your favorite road is closed and you have to take that long detour. But we're developing a whole suite of game-changing tools to integrate space operations into the national aerospace system. These tools are a necessary enabler of growth for commercial space as the operational tempo and frequency of launches and reentries ramp up over the coming years. In August, we plan to deploy the Space Data Integrator, or SDI. Now, SDI, when I was a kid, meant something different. Um, but uh, this, uh, this Space Data Integrator will feed real-time data from the space vehicle into the FAA's traffic flow management system. Now, having that data during an actual operation is a big deal. It'll be like having our own CP3O, but not nearly as annoying. Now, we'll know exactly where the aircraft hazard areas need to be and how long they need to be in existence. And to complement SDI, we're developing an enhanced aircraft hazard area generator. Now, this capability will help us do all of this much more quickly and accurately. 
will be able to block off less airspace and release that airspace faster so it's available for other airspace users. Now, SDI is just one of several capabilities under development at the FAA. There are other ones, such as space integration capabilities, that will provide air traffic controllers with the automation to more efficiently, surgically, and safely route air traffic around space operations, even with the increased cadence that we're projecting in the future. And we're already starting to apply several procedural efficiencies. For example, we're beginning to use time-based procedures much more frequently, where we can let planes approach the aircraft hazard area because we will know exactly what time that airspace will become available again. And we hope and expect that one day we'll be able to reduce the current larger than required hazard areas and reduce the number of aircraft affected by each space mission. Adding on that, we're developing dynamic launch and reentry windows. We'll take triggers from the operator's mission sequence countdown. For instance, if the operator starts a procedure like uh, uh, loading liquid oxygen, for example, then we know that that may trigger a launch within 30 minutes and we can block that airspace more efficiently. We want to know from operators what the various launch triggers are, and then we can work with you to develop these procedures. The better and more dynamically that we can make use of telemetry data exchange and coordination and pre-mission planning phases, the more we can achieve efficiency gains that will give space operators more access to the airspace uh, they need. Now in closing, Today's space pioneers are inspiring a new generation of Americans, and indeed around the globe, just as many of us were inspired decades ago with the Apollo moon landings and the space shuttle missions. Let's continue to collaborate. Let's continue to find better ways to enable this industry. But through it all, together, let's make safety the launch pad from which we make all of this happen. And as we do that, will unleash the benefits of the space economy. And America will continue to lead the world in this arena. And we'll be able to take that next giant leap in, in space transport, which could be the Mars trip. And then after all that, maybe, just maybe, we'll talk about that Kessel run in less than 12 parsecs. So thanks for your time and your attention this morning. It's a privilege and an honor to be with you. And I wish you all the best uh, in the rest of the conference and we look forward to working with you uh, in the years to come. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. That was awesome uh, and a great introduction to our next panel. Of course, we couldn't do a space transportation conference with the FAA without talking about regulatory reform. So while we all have caffeine,